My name is uh, Dino Esposito. I do some work for JetBrains uh, that you know, people who are active, especially in the Microsoft stack, but not necessarily also in the Java space, know this company very well for uh, the tools they do. What they do has not much to do, actually, with uh, what I'm going to uh, present uh, in the next hour and a half or something like that. The sketchy thing and uh, the comeback of flowcharts and top-down uh, refer essentially to a common sense approach. I, I, I mean, doubt whether to say a new common sense approach or just a common sense approach to the whole process of software development. Uh, it comes from uh, years of personal involvement as a, a developer in the beginning, but more recently as an architect and as the chief architect on projects uh, um, in, a specific, in a specific, very specific business domain. But uh, I mean, managing these projects uh, told me a few things uh, that basically I'm ready to share and overall qualify as a new, yet another common sense approach to minimize or at least to keep under control the costs of software uh, development. So essentially we are talking about uh, requirements, user requirements. Uh, mm, I think we, everybody can agree that most of the costs, direct and indirect, of software projects depend on user requirements, how we understand them as architects, and how we handle them, how we pass uh, considerations, instructions that we learn from requirements to the actual people, whether ourselves, our team, or companies living the other side of the world we outsource it to, instructions on the actual code we want to build. Uh, the second two blocks in this uh, talking about slide uh, refer just to the, what I call the solution to the issue of a different, more common sense way of handling requirements. Sign off at the presentation layer. This is the, 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 the new idea, if you allow me to call, to, to use this engaging word. Oh, it's a new approach. Wow. We have a genius in front of us. Okay? No, it's not like this. But anyway. UX first, related to signing off at the presentation level, is the point that says, okay, we are at the end of the day just selling a user experience, so a mix of graphical artifacts, whether a web page or just the front end of a client, a rich client application to customers, and they work through the tools graphical and logical we provide. And uh, the point that I feel to share is most of the time we miss at that point. Not much in the back end, not much in the logic, but in the way in which we offer functionalities, the experience, the way in which we build and study and arrange the final experience. So UX first is the top name for this relatively new, and I like to call it common sense approach. Now, developers and architects, we are not completely idiots, okay? So if we do things in a way that in the end costs us some money, there should be a reason. There is a logical, extremely logical path that you know, we, we, we apply, we, we use every day, that has to be revisited at least. So let's start seeing where we come from. The generation of today's architects, more or less, comes from 90s, the 90s. And in the 90s, when we learned 
the base ground of programming, we had a, a few assets that not in the same way exist today. In particular, we were used, we learned to code and architect systems relying on one powerful, extremely powerful server machine. And then just a few relatively slow personal computers, just clients and one big server. More importantly, we had Okay, imagine now you are face to face with yourself in front of a mirror. You can say that. We had for years a generation of users and users passively accepting whatever interface we were giving them. That's it. I did that, you did that, so it's everybody faced this point. So. Because of this mass of users, we never probably spent much time focusing on the experience, including the interface we were offering to our users. And we thought, maybe reasonably from the perspective of the 90s, we focused much more, we, we reckon a lot more important to focus on the database on the optimization of the database code rather than what we were giving users. Because okay, they accept whatever we do as long as it's, it works quickly is fine. Today, we have, unfortunately or fortunately depends, different assets. In particular, we have oh, so many fancy technologies. So it's no longer just uh, about learning how to code effectively a storage procedure running within SQL Server or Oracle. There's a lot more we can do from the data level up. We have uh, not just one or two dummy PCs, but we have uh, myriads of client devices. And many of them belong to classes completely incompatible. A smartphone is not a PC, a laptop is not a tablet. Not to mention wearables or whatever else. Whatever other fancy technology will come up and show up in a matter of months. And worse yet, we have now a mass of users not passively accepting enforcements, but actively dictating what we should be doing. So the user interface, the consumers of our software are now totally different. And that is the generation of, well, the present, but more importantly, the future. So any piece of software, any enterprise system that has customers or end customers, uh, some sort of consumer level in it should take into serious account the experience that is actually provided to users. But even when the enterprise system is created as a line of business, business app to be used within the company, well, money is still involved because a user experience that is less than optimal can take employees to spend a lot more time for doing the usual tasks, achieving the usual tasks they are supposed to do. So it's in the end, it's, instead of being a direct cost, it becomes an indirect cost, but it's still a cost to the company. So we live clearly now in a different world, but we still, in my opinion, for the most part, try to build software as if this big change in the software world never happened. In the 90s, we had powerful databases, one SQL Server or Oracle or maybe DB2 or maybe SAP, but one big server machine. Super optimized code running within that machine. It made sense 15 years ago because the company spent whew, a vast mass of money to have that server and reasonably the company wanted to take the most out of that machine. So optimizing, having the wicked machine to do, to work as hard as possible. That was precisely a way to 
keep costs under control. Do you remember Windows SNA Server? It was around the late 90s, 2000s. It was a fancy technology, Microsoft technology, to wrap up COBOL procedures, typically but not necessarily in banking environments. Or COM, MTS, Microsoft Transaction Server, DCOM, those kind of things. Oh, we had Visual Basic. <laughs> so the, the combination, Visual Basic uh, for the client, uh, where, OK, it doesn't matter if the PC is low. The PC is always slow, because the PC is not the server. So Visual Basic is more than fine, and it allows us to quickly arrange nicely user interfaces. Oh, the, the, the real meat and potato is on the server. Uh, a generation of architect has grown with the idea that all that matters is the back end, and there is no need to pay attention to whatever exceeds the server environment. Because, well, just a few buttons on a visual basic form, that's it. That's the trick. It works. Users, ha, ah, users, they pay. They don't care. As long as they pay, we're fine. So pillars of the software architecture of the 90s are essentially four, a bottom-up, Development from a solid relational model up to up higher layers, just moving families of records, collections of records down up the stack. Subsequently, business components were typically vertical components just uh, uh, built from one key database table. Uh, I'm going to tell you something about the DDD okay, in just a few slides, and even more in a talk I will have tomorrow. But uh, in domain-driven design that I assume you, for the most part, at least know at least the basics of, there is a concept called the aggregate root, which refers in the DDD terminology to a particular class that then you have to persist to something that happens to be an aggregate root database table. It's the same concept if you get rid of you know, terminology related to uh, methodologies and, and fancy names, but the concept is saying a key piece of information with a pending related sub uh, less important pieces of info. So we just identified in the 90s the key tables in our database and built vertical components capable of doing whatever crude operations, but also business operations on top of the contained data. And uh, we had no classes to express the behavior. The behavior, whatever business logic we needed to have, was already in components bound, tightly bound to database tables. So we just needed a few containers, data containers, to bring data up to the presentation layer. Uh, sometimes they were just record-like structures, ADO.NET record sets in, uh, uh, in the Microsoft uh, stack or similar in, in other uh, environments, or just classes but just DTOs, data transfer objects, anemic models, so with no behavior at all. And then we ended up having three typical layers, presentation business and data, uh, layers or tiers, depending on the idea of scalability of 15 years ago, in which you know, breaking layers in tiers, so in physically separated components, and uh, spreading out those components horizontally by multiplying them with load balancing uh, mechanics or just making that particular machine much, much more powerful, okay, gave us uh, the improvements in scalability we needed. So this was the 90s, the core of our enterprise architecture. Past the 2000, something started to change one of the things that we observed, one of the phenomenon we observed, was the appearance of domain-driven design. 
and uh, domain-driven design, as we learned, as many of us learned in the past years, had a, a couple of concepts which are absolutely critical in DDD as a methodology, but have been kind of misunderstood for years. And uh, nicely enough, the first, <laughs> the most prominent guy who misunderstood the key concept of DDD was the inventor himself of DDD, Eric Evans. There is a YouTube video in which of 2009 uh, was a QCon conference here in London in which Eric Evans says, the title of the talk is What I Have Learned About DDD Since Inception. So the book, the DDD book, the blue book, was published 2003, 2004. So five years later, the same author confessed, and it's a great point about the person, the individual, the man, confessed, well, actually, there are a couple of things in DDD that needs to be given a different shift. And the two things are essentially ubiquitous language and bounded context, which in the idea of DDD that most architects have today are just, okay, like the, the principles of object-oriented design. You must, uh, you must work, to work out uh, classes that represent the entities in the domain. Okay, nah, that, that's obvious, too much obvious. Let's go to the, you know, to the, the real business and ignore, ah, oh, it's a generic reminder about, uh, no, ubiquitous language is a very, very serious thing. It's the most important part of DDD. Has the same Eric Evans. He had the, the brilliant idea of naming the thing ubiquitous language and to justify that to architects. But he himself, in the book, failed in giving ubiquitous language and subsequently bounded context, so subsets of the business domain where the ubiquitous language changes the due importance. And I'm going to talk about these particular points more tomorrow morning in my talk about DDD misconceptions. But anyway, domain-driven design brought a solid, object-oriented metaphor in which something called the domain model, so the all-encompassing, comprehensive representation of whatever happens in the business space that has to be represented through interconnected objects. And whatever was, could be labeled as anemic, anemic compared to rich domain model, the difference is all in how much behavior you code in your classes. So an anemic model is a model, an object model, made of classes that mostly have properties getters and setters, but essentially properties, no methods that perform logic, algorithms, right? Uh, domain model is instead where you, you have classes that represents entities and entities with their data, but also with their behavior. So everything at some point, even in the .NET space, started moving towards objects. By the way, in the Java space instead, the whole thing started a few years in advance. So now, the classic three-tier architecture expanded in four layers. And also, layers or tiers uh, became less relevant in the sense that it's more important just to identify layers, so logical split of functionalities. And then whether or not you turn a layer into a physical tier, so you implement any of those in, on a separate machine running in a separate process space, that is, uh, well, something that has only to do with the level of scalability and performance, overall performance, you expect to reach. But from the design point, layers are important as well. So we have four layers now uh, with different names also. But the infrastructure layer is essentially the data layer that we knew for years, except that the fancy new technologies we have today, uh, one name, NoSQL uh, technologies, uh, uh, really 
take us to give uh, elements in the infrastructure layer essentially any form. It can be uh, what is called polyglot persistence, in which you use, I don't know, something like a, a graph databases to store certain pieces of information. You can use Redis or Cassandra or in-memory caches to store in a format that is immediately easy to consume from the upper layers already there in memory. And then you can have also relational uh, databases for physical, classical persistence. So the infrastructure layer is about data, but it can have a participation of other technologies like uh, uh, polyglot persistence, so no SQL, but also caching, and also, why not, dependency injection. The business tier that we knew for years now was split in two parts, the application layer and uh, the domain layer. So they are two phases of the business logic because we got to know, to understand, to figure out that actually the business logic is made of two parts. And uh, just this distinction was a kind of gray for many, many years. So where the orchestration of the use case belongs, is it core part of the business domain or is it just that it belongs to the application we build for that domain? Uh, today, think of when you have clients significantly different from classic laptops. Think, for example, to websites, right? The content we offer through the website today must be offered for business reasons through mobile applications or even mobile sites, which are websites specifically built for that particular scenario. Now, in the screen of a mobile, whether natively through an app or hybridly through websites, well, you, you cannot fit in four inch what usually goes in 13, 14, 15 inches. So the 80-20 rule, so you only need 20% of the full content to go to reach mobile users Holds. And the, in the 20% or whatever of the functionality and the behavior you really want to have offered to mobile users, it's not unlikely that fall completely different use cases. So it's not just about serving them less data, but also data served in a different way or new functions at all. And when we talk about new functions at all, Okay, it's business, but either we call it business for a completely new application, which involves duplicating part of the logic because it's the, the part of the logic we use to manage the core elements of the domain, or it's just a, a different part of the higher level of the business logic. So application and domain layer are two phases, one on top of the other, that form expands to form the today business layer, in which the application layer is where you just have the orchestration of use cases for all the possible presentations layer you may have, mobile, desktop, this or that. The domain layer is invariant, is the part of the business logic that is completely invariant, ignores the customers. So in a way, in the domain layer, you find the logic about the banking domain, uh, the application layer contains the orchestration of user interface tasks as they are requested by the various presentations. So if you add, at some point, yet another presentation layer, you probably need yet another piece, an extension to the application layer just for the use cases, for the orchestration, that the, the flow charts, okay? You have to implement, but then the flow charts the new flowcharts end up calling into core functions you still find in the domain layer. That's why the domain layer is where the most interesting things about the business happen. And the presentation layer is the most critical at this point. Because uh, if we don't know exactly what's going to have there, whatever else we build below the level of presentation can change at any time. And this is precisely what happens today. 
taking the costs of development to be significantly higher than expected or than usual or than reasonable. We don't know exactly what we want to produce. That's the point, that, as I say things. Okay, feel free to disagree, but that's my perspective of things. We write software without having clear the reason in the scenarios we are writing that software. To this, add that even when we know clearly the use cases we are going to implement, there is the second factor, the smartness of users, which don't content themselves anymore with just a piece of UI that allows them to work reasonably, I would say. So it's about identifying the right use cases and uh, the best ideal experience for each of those use cases. This is something we have to sign off ideally before we start building the foundation of the system. So instead of bottom up, we completely turn it around, it's top down. The foundation becomes the presentation layer and whatever else is a sort of a black box. We can even develop, start developing at a later time once we know exactly and having signed off what kind of data we are expected to send to the UI and receive from the UI on a per, per case, a user case, use case basis. So effects of the DDD revolution, long-term effects are business layer split in application and domain layers. Definition, new definition of what is a domain layer, which is essentially a pretty simple to understand. It's where you have the mechanics of the system yet hard to adopt because, oh, and, and, and now what? And this is where things like CQRS or even sourcing these days, hot topics, hot terms in the software architecture come into play because they are ways to improve the way in which we adopt the principles of domain-driven design. DDD, this said, so domain-driven design, which is simply a methodology that helps us designing a system driven by the business domain. So domain-driven design means exactly what literally it means. Design driven by the business domain. But it is often mistaken and oversimplified to be just, okay, a collection of objects and persisted through entity framework or an hibernate, and the question becomes, is it better to use entity framework or should I use an hibernate? And we focus on critical technologies, but yet implementation details in the context of a large enterprise system. Okay, let's talk about overall methodologies for projects. We observed in 10 years at least the waterfall model to go to the stake, barn to the stake, and uh, agile to, be, to gain the limelight. I have nothing, of course, against agile. It's great. But probably, no, waterfall was not wrong. Per, no, it, what, it was not wrong. The idea of waterfall, okay, sign off each step and proceed to the next only when you're done with the previous. It's not per se a bad idea. Uh, adopted, it turns like a total mess and completely obsolete, not just adequate to the times we're living. So agile is much better in this regard. But you know, if you are too much agile, too much of agility, well, it doesn't give you the, the, the strength to you know, stop at some point and, you know, and, 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 and lift the world on, on, the, on the strength that your leg, just because you're standing in some place, can, can, can develop. So, okay, waterfall, the classic waterfall is out of place, out of question. But also I would say rethink about what, what Agile takes you to do. It's great to change, to rewrite, to change, to rewrite, but you change and rewrite what? User requirements. Uh, we are now used to the idea that we discover user requirements on the go. Day one, we start, we, we have a 
some sort of understanding of what we want to do, and we start writing code. Code first, code first, code from day one. Maybe a sprint zero, just not start coding and stabbing in the dark. OK, great. But at that point, it starts a process in which you start coding on a faint understanding of what is the final destination. You know that you are going west. Hey, but west from London can mean you know, a wide range of final destinations. You probably need to gain uh, more details about the final destination to, 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 to define a path, maybe not the optimal path right away, but in a path that can take you there with the smallest possible number of iterations, of, of requests for changes, right? Because every request for change may be more money for the software house if you work for hire, but it also brings the cost up for uh, the buyer. And this is never a great news, even for the software house that works for hire. So when costs go up, not necessarily is a great news for all parties involved. So we complain that requirements change constantly. But uh, why they change constantly? Uh, one possible reason, and take this as a, a small doubt I'd like to humbly instill in your minds, because it's been in my mind for a long time, is maybe it's, be, it's, because, it's also because of the way we architects deal with requirements. The agile iterations probably you know, spin up too often, too quickly, without giving us enough time to learn and figure out what we're doing, why we are running that particular sprint. Discover, so, and discover on the go requirements and requirements that change constantly, they go together. They are tightly and strictly related. And both contribute to raise the average cost of a project. It's their mechanics. I mean, that's it. It's part of the, it's physical. It's just physics. It's a different world, but we keep on designing code as we were in the 90s from the database up. I could be, you can agree or disagree with this. But this is the foundation for uh, the common sense UX first design methodology that I'm going to introduce now. So relax for a couple, for a few moments. This is a very popular. Dilbert strip. I think this was uh, created in 2001. So 15 years ago, sort of. So it's a long story. Your user requirements include 400 features. Do you realize that no human <laughs> okay, will be able to use a product with that level of complexity? And the answer, I think everybody can guess what the answer is. Oh, good point. And for a moment, you think, wow, I can't believe I have a, you know, a counterpart, a stakeholder that understands business. No, it says, good point. I'd better have the easy to use to the list. OK? Oh. Trying to express the same concept graphically, going back to so why. We are building systems like this. We have a foundation. They told me not to trespass the border here. For, okay, sorry. Uh, we have a, a foundation here, the solid foundation represented by the database and uh, the data here. And we expose, because that's the foundation, we expose hooks for higher levels of code to connect to. And at the end of the day, we end up instead pushing something that, you know, from the top has to connect to what we have defined. At, at the beginning, it represents the foundation of the code. And sometimes, you know, the, 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 
what comes from the top and what comes, what emerges from the bottom, they don't match. Just like when, you know, I think it was the Second World War, someone attempts to take train tracks to Russia to figure out that the width of tracks was different. We often have a sort of a problem like this. And when we have this problem, when we face this problem, well, it's a cost because something has to be changed. UX first. Uh, the idea is having two different roles of architect. Not necessarily two different people. Roles is not necessarily the same. So its role is a job. So a, a role in a job. So it could be different people, or it could be new skills added on top of the same physical individual. The software architect, as we know it today, the blue pill, which does interviews to collect requirements, extract business information out of requirements to build the domain layer. And the UX architect, which in parallel <coughs> interviews the same users, or, okay, interviews end users in particular, so with the same users but with a particular focus on end users to collect usability requirements and on top of that, build what they think to be the ideal user experience to be implemented in the presentation layer. So it's two different things. And today, we do the blue part. For the most part, we don't do. We don't care about the red part. Or the best we do today is delegating the red part to a design company or a designer we hire, often a designer we don't even have in the company, but we, that works for hire from the outside. And uh, in doing so, we probably look at the costs we may face if we bring the guy within the company. It becomes a fixed cost. But we ignore, most of the time, the indirect costs we have by having the guy work from the outside on such a critical part of the project. The point is that we just don't realize how critical the user experience and the presentation layer is. Architects of the 90s still think, yeah, it's a bit of buttons on Visual Basic 4. I'm the first. So, yeah, if you remember the blue pill, the red pill, I think it was Matrix or something, yeah. The blue pill was, uh, would you like uh, living in a world of illusion? In this case, it's the developer illusion that if you have a database that rocks, you're fine. Or the red pill, experience the real world. Okay, you can even have the world's strongest and fastest database, but if you don't put users and users if you don't enable them to actually trigger the tasks that will make the power of the backend shine, I'm sorry, but you, you're lost. So concretely, how can we try to achieve UX first? I think it's uh, no more than three key steps. No code, just uh, you know, three steps in in the way in which we plan software development. The first thing, preliminary step, the first step we run preliminarily is having clear the use cases. Uh, okay, the screen we have to produce. In the end, a software application is a collection of screens. And even if you do, in a web scenario, single page applications in which you have just one or just a few HTML pages that change content dynamically. By screen, I mean each individual piece of functional screen you offer to your users, regardless of the number of HTML pages you have in, uh, in a single page application scenario. But if you, if you think about uh, 
ASP.NET websites, I'm talking about the number of ASPX pages, or if you're doing MVC, the number of Razor views. So once you have a clear the number of screens and the content, a rough idea of the content in terms of graphical elements, uh, data elements, forms, you have to put there. The first step is for each of them build up UI forms, has users, love them. But it means that you have to go back and forward to users to make sure that they love it. They feel they can work effectively with that user interface. And uh, at this point, you are not writing any code yet. Second, when you have uh, clear in your mind what you're going to serve to users, uh, you define workflows because every screen, uh, this is a UML that says that, okay? The use case diagram in a UML, so it's not something I invented myself right now. The use case of a UML says, define actors involved in a use case. So in each screen, it should be clear. That, okay, the, the graphical elements you wanna have, partly defined by the UX architect, but also the actors. So the actions, the triggers, the data to be shown and the, and the actions to be triggered against the back end. And each action, each clickable buttons, each piece of UI that triggers an action to the back starts a workflow. A workflow in the end is a flow chart. <laughs> Here, the connection with the flow chart in the title of this talk. So define workflows from there. And workflows define the application layer. Then, the obvious final step is connect workflows to biz logic. And at this point, create pieces of biz logic that can be reused if you're good at that, or just you know, vertical components. At that point, the domain model comprehensive approach of DDD becomes just one possible implementation detail. Because biz logic could be, if, you're, if you feel good at that, it could be a comprehensive model. If you don't trust your developers, if you don't trust yourself, if you don't like the domain model idea, you can even go with plain vertical components uh, in terms of pattern transaction script. In nicer terms, CQRS with uh, read and write stacks completely separated. It may not be fancy if you build a case study on because you're probably not using or not immediately using fancy terms, but your code works. It definitely works. Simpler, effective, straight to the point. But today, with the complexity of today's software, straight to the point that works, it's the best, okay, attribute. It's the best statement one can make about a piece of software. This arrow, this line, this timeline is not continuous. It cannot be continuous. Because if you don't put a breakpoint right after or right before the workflows, you are constantly risking to go back and iterating between the two parts of this, let's say it's a software architecture islands and the trespassing, you know, building bridges, okay, across architecture islands can definitely be costly. And for what I know, for what is my experience, this is the sore point of most architecture these days. Sign off, summarizing, sign off on what users really want, how. There are three tools we can leverage. Sketches and or wireframes and mockups. I put sketches and wireframes at the same level, <coughs> meaning that you know, depending on a context, you can use only wireframes or only sketches. Not necessarily you have to go through sketches and wireframes. You likely want to use mockups. Going straight with mockups 
which is something I've seen happening, often is risky, in my opinion, because uh, the, the sketch or the wireframes gives developers, architects, you know, a clearer idea of the, the layout of the screen they have to create as the end point of the back end. The mock-up, because it's confused with graphics, with graphical elements, is a mock-up is just a PNG. It's a Photoshop file. You, you risk of getting lost in terms of how constituent elements, data elements, really work together. Mock-ups are fantastic for you and users. But for developers, and also for users, two, step, two steps, sketches or wireframes, and then mock-up together works. If you have time only for one of them, I would recommend you go with wireframes. And once you have, a, when it's, when, when it, once it's clear what users really want, you build prototypes from uh, requirements. Now, I would recommend not writing code at this time. So you iterate. So the sign off comes here. So you talk, you figure out, you create wireframes and you get approval on wireframes, just uh, you know, removing things that may, it's clear that they don't work because you misunderstood, you, you got it wrong. They explain it wrong. There might be several reasons why the message doesn't reach in the right form. But changing a wireframe is changing a sort of VCO diagram or a PowerPoint or a balsamic file. When you know, things start solidifying, if you have time and budget, you can produce more cups. This is what you're going to get. Is that OK? Yes, it's OK. If you have time, and I would recommend finding time and budget for that because it saves money later, build a prototype. So a quick idea, OK? The system is going to work like this. If you're talking about a website, put a website on. And let users play. There's no logic attached. It's just the user interface, the presentation. Is this the way you want to work? Because it's just about you know, creating a few interactions between a, few, a navigation between web pages or XAML front ends, it takes time, but it's not a huge amount of time. It's uh, extra cost. Yes, but it saves money. Not in the long run. It saves money soon, right after that. Because once everything has been signed off, it's the first step of the old waterfall methodology. That point onward, you're on the right track. I mean, OK, we live in an imperfect world, so nobody can give you the absolute certainty okay, that you are really on the right track. But the odds are not against you. So it's really, really likely that you are on the right track. There may be still room for going back and change things. OK, but that is probably a reason that you know, depends, strictly depends on business, especially if you work with startups these days. It's not completely clear what they want and how they want to do it. So in this case, they may sign off one day and then change idea a week later, a month later, three months later, when the product, full product, is not complete yet. Be ready to this. But that, there is a strong evidence in this, in this case that the change occurred because of a business change or a different perception of the business. It's not that it, it has to change because you got it wrong. Or with the excuse, oh, but the, the, the text or the, the, doc, the word document was not clear enough. Well, honestly, the primary role of an architect is making sense of requirements. Don't expect the requirements flow in from the customer in the right form. It's you, part of your classic software architect job role, to get back to customers to ask for clarifications. And the things like uh, uh, ISO architecture 
requirements, the usability, scalability, blah, 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 classes of attributes, those boring things, they exist just to guide you on how to treat the mass of incoherent, abundant, sometimes lacking, but you know, requirements. They come in a very raw form. It's your job, it's my job, it's your job to put order in that mess. But if you don't know very, very in depth the domain, if requirements are really incomplete because the stakeholders themselves don't know exactly what they want, these are part of the real world, but I think, honestly, humbly, that this approach, you, you put evidence in front of the users, hey, you look, you asked me this, working in this way with, as the prototype demonstrates, okay, you change, it's okay, but you pay now for this. Okay, I used a few terms, sketch, wireframes, prototypes. Let's clarify what they mean. A sketch is a freehand drawing. Okay, uh, typically it's done on a napkin, okay, when you are sitting in a restaurant during a business, <coughs> business lunch. Uh, okay, uh, there are tools, balsamic is one of those, that help you, you know, start sketching ideas like this. But in general, a sketch is just a freehand drawing. A wireframe is a more precise sketch where it's clear the layout of the screen, the navigation logic, the content, and the storyboard you are going to build. So the connection between different wireframes. Uh, it doesn't focus much on UI details, whether it's a combo box, it's a list box, it's a, a pop-up, a pop-over, yeah, tooltip, yeah. It's not at this level of detail, but all of the pieces fit together in the form, in the, in, in the rendered uh, diagram, and the, the navigation from one piece to another is clear. And finally, a mock-up is just wireframe with some sample UI attached. And in this case, we are just talking about CSS or, or graphical teams, okay, on top of um, a clearly defined layout and a mock-up uh, also involves a technology. So because if you are talking about a website, it's one thing. If you are talking about WPF, it's going to be something different. Uh, I mentioned uh, prototype, prototype, goes hand in hand with other two terms, one of which is proof of concept. Proof of concept is a small exercise, so running code, but a small exercise to test an idea. Or maybe to just play, experiment with a new technology. You write something just to see if it's doable. That's it. A prototype is not to see if the idea can be taken farther. It's when you take the idea just farther. And farther means a system that simulates the full system you're going to build with some missing pieces. Uh, the typic, what, what I typically do when I build a prototype is UI only, maybe not the final UI, but you know some UI so where it's clear how the the system navigates from page to page and what each page does. So typically co data collection and rendering. There is no business and data in the middle. If I need to persist in data, I use a SQL Express. Or, uh, and I use CAN components that, that where data and logic is just hard coded. Very simple, very, you know, very basic, but still serving data in and out has the full system it was supposed to do. So users can see face to face if the system is, uh, once you just attach the real logic, works the way they should, they like. And finally, a pilot, just to complete the terminology, a pilot project is a full production system, okay? But put on stage, okay, typically on a staging dot site.com, okay, working on a subset of the general intended audience or data, or end audience and data. But it's the full system, 
not working, okay, as in production, in a smaller, simpler environment, but a full system. Okay. The point of uh, capturing, the, the point that, you know, should, uh, should give you the, 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 the immediately the, the ROI, the benefit of UX first, is catching bottlenecks in the user experience. In the, like, like it or not, it's there that the problems arise. So when users require changes, okay, it could be that they missed an attribute, a piece of logic, but sometimes complaints comes for, uh, from the, 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 the point of usability of the user interface. Yeah, I don't know how you are here, how it works here in the UK, but in Italy you cannot find a public a website for a train company to a uh, mail company that works as you expect. I mean, they are, I mean, buying a train ticket is an, you know, it's a mess. You know, oh, I got it, my God, I've been able to, a friend tweeted last day, I've been able to buy a ticket online, a train ticket online from trainitalia.com. I've got refunded for a train ticket from trainitalia.com. I can't believe it. So avoiding these uh, extreme situations is just a purpose of UX first. And I would recommend, it's much better to invest time on really understanding the expected and ideal mechanics of screens and related tasks rather than to understand what was the real intended meaning later and write code fixing, trying to reuse the code that already exists. It takes more time, sure. That's why I call it, so, I call it a responsive waterfall in a way, right? It, it takes more time because it, you have to justify, if you're not the project manager yourself, you have to justify this extra startup cost and startup time because you actually start producing code. But uh, I mean, I think it's obvious to software minds, okay, the benefits of the approach. If it's, if it's clear where you're going, you go. You just go. It takes the time to write code, but you don't have to, you, you go, you write code straight, not write code, you know, having a lot of curves along the way. Domain modeling, that's another a critical point, a misconception we inherited from domain-driven, from misunderstandings of domain-driven design. To me, sometimes it, it seems like uh, developers and architects think like they're God, and they have to create and express the world. No, it's not like this. I mean, domain modeling is, has to be functional to what you're doing, and you know what you're doing if you... Okay, either if uh, your stakeholders are so great at describing what they want through requirements, or if you are so great at understanding and figuring out screens and tasks with the approval of customers. Either way, most of the second way. So the model has to be function of screens, and functional only to what screens and tasks and related tasks need to do. Let me give you, a, a, a thing. I think it's a, it's a great example of what I mean by a model that has, it is functional to what you're doing. This is a geographical map. I invite you to focus on a couple of areas here. Alaska and Brazil. Now, question. Looking at the map, is Alaska as large as Brazil? I would say yes. Uh, looking at the map. Sort of. Would you believe that instead the real size of Brazil is five times the size, the extension of Alaska? Okay, you, you may say, okay, Brazil is larger than Alaska, but it's not certainly five times larger. So the map is wrong. It depends. The map is perfectly functional to a particular business domain. Of course, because it's functional 
to a particular business domain, it could be non-functional, so wrong, in another business domain. It's all about understanding what is your business domain. Now, this particular map is not a Google map, okay? But it's a Mercator projection map. I confess I had no idea what a <laughs> Mercator projection map actually was until my co-author on the uh, recently received Microsoft uh, Architecting Applications for the Enterprise book uh, uh, told me. So actually, uh, this is an excerpt from, uh, from the book. The Mercator map is a model that deliberately distorts areas and distances, especially when you go from the equator up and down to poles. The scale becomes infinite, so the, the more you go farther from the equator in both directions, the more that, that, that the scale used to render geographical areas uh, becomes infinite, so the Alaska, which is at the top, is much smaller than it actually is. And, uh, okay, so there is a reason, and nautical cartography, that's the reason, for the Mercator map. And uh, I would like to, to, be, okay, to be able to just to, because I'm not able to repeat this, so I have to read to explain what is the, biz, the, Roy, the business reason for having such a Mercator map. So let's read that together. Essentially, when you draw a course, okay, on a Mercator world projection, the angle between the course and the equator remains constant across the meridians. And that makes, uh, I saw some face, I, I don't know if it's true. I mean, I'm just <laughs> quoting. <laughs> but anyway, fact is that since the 16th century, this projection has been used to travel the world. And uh, in the 16th century, it was the time in which Columbus discovered United, the, the, to the America and uh, Portuguese explorers found about uh, Africa, the South Africa, the Good Hope Cape, Australia, later on, and so forth. So it worked in the end, okay? So there should be a reason for that. But actually, the, the Mercator map compared to Google map is different. Uh, you see clearly the, 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 the South America continent or the Africa continent is uh, stretched because uh, the, the, one of the key rules of the Mercator project is that every square, regardless of the size of the square on the map, refers to the same geographical area. So the, 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 the square area is the same. But anyway, if you are writing software for... Um, nautical cartography, you don't need Google Map. You better need the Mercator Map. You say, well, but I'm, I'm representing a distorted world. Yes, but that distorted world is functional to the business domain you're in. That's it. It's so simple. So responsibilities of the new figure of a UX expert. So I told you that it would be ideal to have two architect roles, classic software architect plus UX architect. What we expect from the UX architect? The ability to identify and express the information architecture. And after that, the best way for people to interact and visualize any content. Information architecture is a nice term to indicate uh, how information flows essentially from the folds, the interior of the system up to what is physically perceived and displays to users. Uh, let me open a brief parenthesis. Uh, when we talk about polyglot persistence or if we, we talk about things like event sourcing, and no SQL tools like RavenDB or MongoDB or this or that. And they claim, rightly, the ability to persist objects as they are. 
Even sourcing is about another you know, architecture relevant approach says, okay, look, you persist any information you have about an event. A booking has been made into this, uh, entered into the system. These are the information about the booking. Flight, blah, 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 whatever it is. You change something. You don't overwrite the record you saved previously with the same ID. But you just add another record that says that the booking with the ID has been changed, and these are the new values for the fields that have changed. It, it means that you have to, to find the actual state of the booking you have to find to retrieve all orders you have, in, you have logged with the same ID and rerun, replay all of them to building the current state. But in, in doing so, however, it takes maybe a little more time to capture the current state, to read back, to query the data, but you don't lose any single piece of information. This is the way in which banking systems work. Okay? They use a lot of optimization techniques so that if you want to know the balance of your bank account, you don't have to go through the million operations you've made in the past 20 years or the last time, that, or when, the years ago that you opened, you started your, your bank account. There are techniques to optimize and make it faster, but that's the idea. So if you reason about it in this scenario, the data you save is not the data you retrieve. And also, I mentioned even source, but I could say CQRS, another fancy name. Separation between query and commands. You write, the command takes you to write data in one format, and when you read it back, it has a different format. That, for the most part, depends on the user interface. And this is the job of the UX expert. So the software architect makes sure ensures that whatever is being persisted or just logged contains all details about known details about the operation, the user command. The role of the other architect is uh, making sure that the information is extracted and massaged and aggregated together, manipulated, so that it can be quickly retrieved and show up in the UI with no intermediation. Uh, an emerging architecture today is having, uh, is, is based on a separation between command stack and query stack, in which the query stack is a plain two tier or two layer UI directly data bound to a layer, a quick layer, where you just run entity framework queries or link queries or SQL server queries. No intermediation, no data, uh, no, no complex model, just DTOs that go as we were doing. 15 years ago. But the complexity is in tracking all of the things and implementing the logic server side in, in common. But in doing, in writing the common logic, you don't have to care about how you read it back. So you have less responsibilities to take. So everything, you have two different uh, frameworks, stacks, with possibly different people and teams working on that and no interaction, no dependency, if not just the physical structure of some databases. And in this regard, the role of the UX expert ensures that you can work with separated stacks at the same time so that the data that comes up to the presentation fits the expectations of users. And also, another responsibility of the UX expert is uh, usability reviews which is not saying I'm, I took a course on usability and I'm an expert, or I've been a designer for 20 years, so I'm an expert. It says uh, it doesn't exclude taking classes, of course, but uh, it mostly means talking to users, listening to user feedback, and even observing users in action with uh, prototypes or the first releases of the final product, even filming users. 
you see that. I mean, the, the, I went myself through a similar experience. I mean, I created a small software, a small website for internal purposes, right? And uh, it was uh, my, my company, we, we do, in, the, in my, my company, IT services for professional tennis, right? And one of the services we do for ATP, WTA tournaments is uh, providing animations, or TV overlays for uh, whatever they do publicly. Uh, one of the things that we started doing earlier this year was uh, animations for the draw ceremony. Now, they told me that the, when the, you know, in a, in a public, in, a, in a top level tournaments, there is the draw ceremony, uh, the, the position of players in, in the draw follow strict rules. So they, I mean, I, I read carefully uh, the document and I thought I created a system that with a minimum effort allowed users to place, uh, use the operator to place the name of the player in the right position in the draw and then exposing at the same time uh, a service, a JSON service to the Flash application used to create the TV overlays. So we had a, a guy who wrote the Flash app and the operator. Okay, a guy from the company who was just, has to be quick to, okay, to read the name of the player as it was uh, drawn from the officer and type in the system in the right position so that it could be immediately displayed in a matter of milliseconds for, on TVs. Okay, for the seated players, yeah, probably, because we entered the list of seated players right away, right before the, the system started, so it was just a number. Okay, number, seed number, one, two, three, four, five, and it was immediately automatic, totally automatic. Non-seeded players, they had to type. Okay, auto-completion, whatever. But actually, there were a couple of things in the overall process that, to me, when I tried the system repeatedly in my office, raised no issue at all. But when tried live during a process, they put for the first couple of times a lot of pressure on the operator. Okay, there was undo, so they, they, they could manage to, to have the, the show go on, but there was a lot of pressure. So they came back to me with a list of things about the usability of the system that has a and software architect, I never imagined was so critical. So this is what I mean by listening to the feedback and observing users live or using the system live yourself, if that is possible. It depends on, on the type of the system, right? But yeah, this is essentially two things. These are two things that make a huge change. And if you can catch these things quickly, you save a lot of complaints you build a much better reputation for your customers. And in the end, trust me, you and your customers save money. Focus is the data flow, much more than just the colors, the graphics, the borders that you put on. In the end, this uh, picture says that, it, it, yeah, design can be fantastic can be smart, but if you miss something, the user experience <laughs> necessarily becomes much less enticing. And out of this, the builder gets a bad reputation because you've been so an idiot, such an idiot, to build a great, fantastic system, but you put a bar. So in the best, I have to go rise the, rise the bar myself to pass. If I have a car, or the bar, worse yet, is fixed. Oh, I have to <laughs> okay, bend myself and pass down or jump over the bar. The system is beautiful, okay? But the user experience not necessarily is as smooth as the intentions of the designer. So for each screen, Determine what comes in and out. 
So once you have wireframes for each screen, turn that into a class. Input model, so the data that from the UI goes into the back end of the system, and a view model, what comes from the system to populate the screen. So once you know what comes in and what comes out of a screen, for each screen, you have everything you need. You don't need, the, the, the next problem is just how you work with that information. But if you can sign off on screens for each screen, and you know, sign off what comes in and what comes out, <gasps> everything else is up to you. I mean, as long as it changes, there's a, 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 an explicit request for change, the data flow, having that fixed, changes completely the world. It's only about you and your ability to, and your team ability to write code. At that point, you can make uh, the application layer, which is the set of classes you call right from the UI, uh, talking MVC, it's uh, the set of classes you call right from controllers. With no dependency on controllers, because if, say, the application layer needs to process content from the session state. You don't pass the session state, but you just extract data and pass the data into the application layer classes so that it can be tested in total isolation. And make those endpoints. The application layer has public methods. Each of these methods must be connected to an action, a button click in some of the screens. And this uh, button click has a basic exchange of data determined at point one, what comes in and what comes out. And finally, the application layer is a black box. You can put underneath that level whatever logic you want, and you orchestrate tasks and uh, layers down the stack up to, down to persistence, and like this, essentially. But whatever you do in the black box can be changed without involving too much users with the guarantee that whatever is on top of the black box works for users. It may take ages to write the black box. In the worst case, if it takes ages to write the black box, at least you're guaranteed that users will love it in the end. It is, well, not the ideal result, but it's much better than what we have today, what we get today, most of the time. So tools for uh, UX architects. Essentially, the job of a UX architect is about sketching, so creating ideas, shareable ideas of what goes into each uh, screen form, storyboarding, so building a navigation system across the screens, and, okay, creating classes, okay, out of those wireframes. Uh, a couple of tools that I know which do part of this job are Balsamic, which is a, a desktop product, but also a cloud a product you subscribe to, and UX Pin, uh, which is only available, as far as I know, as a cloud system. You, you pay on a monthly basis, a per usage uh, basis. Uh, personally, I'm a user of the desktop edition of Balsamic. Uh, I don't like, actually, completely those tools, but both can be functional. In particular, what I don't like in both tools is... Uh, their uh, limited or inability, limited ability or just inability to create and test storyboards so that users you know, can, okay, I say, oh, this is my home screen. Okay, uh, I have a few buttons here. If I click this button, I would like to see automatically in an animation, in a storyboard, the next wireframe associated to this. Uh, to my knowledge, this feature is little available, it's not available or not the way it should in, in the products I mentioned, and I don't know about other products that can do that. 
Uh, a second thing that these don't do is, okay, I have this. Can you help me generating some C-sharp class? Maybe not the perfect class, but a class that saves me a bit of work. Uh, now, this is a balsamic screen. Balsamic is the source file of this is based on XML. So it, it's not completely impossible to create a, a, your own tool that parses this a relatively simple XML, reads the name of the tag for each UI element, and generates what you define to be. I mean, for example, this is a button, so I, I need no UI, or perhaps just a string for the label. Or then you see maybe uh, this is going to be uh, a tab, so I, I might want to have a collection of tab objects. Or I have a, a text box, okay, that I need to have a read-write property for that. Example. So simple things like this, just a, an helper tool to speed up the process of writing code because you actually have to write code for the classes that describe what goes in and out of input forms. But anyway, you can go to users and show something like this. Okay, this is the home page that we're going to have. Uh, maybe you can find in, well, not here, but in the next a few slides, text written in Italian because this comes from a project I was working on last week. So it can be something like this. This is for a booking system. This is the form that when you, users want to create a new, we're talking about uh, a tennis club, and we're talking about um, booking a court in, on a tennis club. Uh, we, we're talking about this. So uh, I am this player, and uh, I want to book a court playing with player number two, uh, who's going to pay how much each pay for the, for the fee. Uh, OK, I want to only have friends of mine, and so forth. So we, this has been created looking at requirements. And uh, next week, I will see the customer to see, OK, this is what I've taught. But it took me a couple of hours. So no big effort. So it's something billable, but you know, it's just a small bill, actually. Or, OK, uh, when the user clicks on the profile up there, it sees something like this. Uh, we, so the, the, the user screen presents the avatar, basic information, change password, delete account, uh, add a Facebook uh, credentials, or maybe a personal social contact play with uh, no, notes about info that you expect to see there. I'm not talking about the graphical way in which I'm going to present uh, the social, the Twitter account. It doesn't matter. In the social tab, I'm going to show uh, excerpts from the Facebook page, the Twitter page, whatever the user has provided credentials for. <coughs> or maybe, OK, that's it. So this is essentially the idea. So in summary, pillars of modern software are essentially top-down design, which is what I presented and shared in this talk. And in terms, in more concrete terms, the idea of top-down design can be you know, implemented through bounded context at the design level. So the ability and the attitude to split a business domain in smaller pieces. A bounded context is a subdomain, essentially. Uh, OK, the rules that you use to split, to recognize subdomains in a business domain and to implement them as bounded context. Bounded context is a fancy name from DDD, but essentially it's a subdomain, okay? It's a partition of the entities in the original business domain. Uh, identifying bounded context, to identify them, you use uh, ubiquitous language, so you try to learn Knowns, verbs, terminology in the business. You come with a glossary. And whenever you find, and you find them, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of words, okay? When you find that one term 
has two or more meanings. Or the same term is used, yeah, to, 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 the same term means the same, different terms mean the same thing or vice versa. The same term indicates different things. That's, you, you crossed the boundary of a different subdomain. You want to reason about the best way to split those concerns. It's, it's common. It's much more common than you may think, okay? But the lesson number one from DDD is exactly that. When you cross the boundaries where the ubiquitous language, the language of the business changes, the best thing you can do is split implementation. It's different subsystems, period. Each subsystem called bounded context has its own ubiquitous language, so its own language of the business, and has its own implementation. The domain model, which is often associated with uh, domain-driven design, is just one possible way of implementing a piece of the domain. So you can have multiple subdomains, or so a, a huge domain partitioned in several subdomains, even with some overlapping, okay? And each of these subdomains can be and should be implemented in the best way that is functional to the final system. So it could be that you have a domain model somewhere and a plain CRUD somewhere else. You can have a CRM in some places and maybe a CMS in another places. It doesn't matter. It's not true, no longer true that one all encompassing model for one single domain rules the world. This is the biggest mistake uh, we can make these days. And this is, has to do with CQRS. Because CQRS is emerging now, has a reaction just to the idea of having a whole comprehensive model to rule all parts, all behaviors you recognize in the system. And if you do so, uh, when you mix reads and writes together, uh, it happens that requirements, constraints on rights affect reads and vice versa. Uh, if you focus on the stack model and read model separately, the, even when you take the domain model approach you want to build for the common side, one system that rules all possible scenarios and situations, without the burden of having to read that data back, Things are far, far simpler. There are typically many relationships that drive you crazy in an all encompassing read write model together are one to many become one to one or just no relationships at all in the sole context of command. This simplifies, greatly simplifies. Uh, in my book, I, I, I summarize in terms of, in mathematical terms the difference between classic DDD and the CQRS by saying that the complexity, where the complexity of DDD, of a DDD solution is n square, is n by, is, is n plus n, is 2n in CQRS. So you have the sum of two, the complexity of two different systems instead of having the exponent, one by one. It makes a huge, huge difference. And layers, well, because each system, each subsystem is better rendered. But this is obvious, so I don't even need to spend any time uh, pushing you know, the importance of layers in, uh, in software. Uh, layers in software, however, are uh, these days even more important because uh, la layers help the design. And what about tiers? Tiers these days are much less relevant. Uh, the, what is emerging to be, the, concretely, the best way to scale applications up is having one full stack, okay, multi-layer but single stack application. Put that on a web role, web job on Azure, just if you wanna talk Azure, and scale horizontally by multiplying Azure roles. That is extremely effective in terms of costs and also in terms of development. Uh, you don't have tiers, so you don't spend the time in serialization. Uh, everything is extremely compact because it lives in the same process space, 
layers help design and help fixing things or replacing things should this be uh, the case of. Scalability, Azure does that by multiplying horizontally uh, and makes you really as elastic with your business and your growth of business as you need to be. Okay, that's it. I, I counted more than 30 of you. I need 30 people to follow me to reach the 3K, <laughs> okay? <laughs> the 3K uh, boundary, ideally by the end. Tell your friends if you, if you already follow me, but anyway. Uh, thank you very much for your time. If you have a few questions, we have uh, some uh, 10 minutes so we can, because we, this is the end of the day. Otherwise, uh, feel free to go to Enjoy London and thank you for your time.